Right, well, thank you. I think we'll uh, make a start. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to this webinar today, where we will be looking at um, the prospects for young people in growth areas um, at the moment and in the future. So my name is Bronwyn Clark. I'm Executive Officer of the National Growth Areas Alliance. And um, I'm really pleased to um, welcome you all here today. I'd like to acknowledge that um, I'm coming to you from my home office in Melbourne, where um, I've been since March. Uh, but I am, would like to acknowledge that I'm on the land of the Boomerang people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respect to their elders past and present. Um, I'd like to introduce you to our panellists today, uh, Rebecca Milnes, who is the Manager of Community Services at the City of Armidale. you want to give a wave, Rebecca? Uh, to Louis Pri, who is the Manager of Economic Development and Advocacy at the City of Armidale. And to Dr Lizzie Knight, who's a Research Fellow at the Centre for International Research on Education Systems at Victoria University. I'd like to acknowledge also that um, we have a lot of our member councils here and a couple of councillors, I think. So I'd like to acknowledge um, everyone who's online today. A um, bit of housekeeping. Um, it's for some reason on my attendee list, everyone has come up as me. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, I do try and be in many places at the same time, but um, if, if you're willing to experiment and perhaps right click or, 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 or click on your name and try and change it, that would be great, but um, no problem otherwise. Um, what we'll do is we'll hear from Rebecca, Lizzie and Louise in that order, and then we'll have time for a Q&A session at the end. So um, if you uh, look on your screen down the bottom and, and hover over the bottom, there's a QA and a um, icon. So if you click into that, um, please um, write your question in there and um, you can identify yourself too if you're coming up with my name. So apologies, apologies for that, a little glitch. Um, we are recording this webinar and we will be making it available to our members um, in the future as well as some resources from today and um, a background paper that we're putting together predominantly around this issue of, of young people and access to education and, and future job prospects. So I might um, just very quickly give you a quick overview of um, a nas the national situation for young people. Um, and I'll just share that. Um, Australia's growth areas, as people know, are predominantly on the outskirts of metropolitan areas across all of our capital cities. Um, we are generally in designated growth corridors and have double the national population growth rate. We're characterised by rapid and sustained population growth rates. So here we have the 2016 population numbers, 4.6 million. We know by 2019 that reached over 5 million. We have double the national average population growth rate um, and the workforce is, is really growing very rapidly um, compared to the rest of Australia. What we know about growth areas is that young people are our specialty. If you look at this graph down the bottom of the younger age, um, age groups, and we have much higher than average concentration of young people, um, that evens out between 20 and 30. But then um, when we get to parent stage, families, um, then we again have higher than the national average of people in those age brackets. So if there is one word to sum up um, growth areas, it is families and it is children. That's two words, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we've calculated that there are 1.7 million people under the age of 25 living in growth areas. Now it's really important to remember here when we talk about growth areas, 
we're talking about around 30 local government areas. So that's, you know, 6% of all LGAs in Australia um, account for, you know, 20% of the, of the population and 1.7 million people under 25. So the scale of what we're dealing with is, is vast. Here's a quick snapshot with a cute photo. Um, in Wyndham in Southeast Melbourne, 100 babies are born every week in that municipality and that's getting bigger. And in Hume, they're projecting a 65% increase in primary school age children um, and a birth increase of 145%. So that's gonna be a population explosion in Melbourne's North. And another characteristic, which we'll go into more today, is around lower educational attainment. And so, you know, that is limiting young people's um, career pathways, job prospects. Um, there's a significant gap in attainment of a bachelor degree. If you look at here, the line across the middle is the national average and all but three of our growth area councils are a long way from meeting that national average in bachelor degrees. Similarly, um, we've got a really startling number of people with no qualification. So, you know, there are some significant gaps there which will impact um, job prospects. Another really um, worrying number, and this again is 2016, so we're not even looking at, at current times and the impact of COVID yet, because um, that data is not quite available yet, but the number of disengaged people under 25 is between 15 and 24 is much higher than the national average. And in some council areas that's, um, you know, th there's some alarming rates of between 20 to 30% of young people are disengaged, out of work and not studying. In recent times, we've seen um, across Australia, a massive increase in um, job seeker and youth allowance recipients. Um, so that's gone up by five percentage points in growth areas just in a few months. And here we have just a snapshot of a couple of councils um, and, and the, the percentage increase in their job seeker and youth allowance, which unfortunately are not disaggregated, so we can't differentiate. But you know, there's tens of thousands of people just in those few councils who are now um, out of work um, and out of study. So, um, I might skip over this graph because it's so busy, but there's a lot in it and we will share these slides. But this is an indication from the city of Playford of the youth unemployment rate in dark blue um, as compared to the CFA index. So if the national average for the CFA index is about here, you know, most of our councils are under the national average, higher levels of disadvantage. And look at these dark blue rates of youth unemployment. It, they're really significant. Um, so I will um, I will stop sharing my screen there, and I will um, hand over to Rebecca Milnes, who is the manager um, of community development um, at City of Armadale, and she's going to talk us through uh, what they're doing, um, what the City of Armadale is all about. And, and share some of their exciting achievements. And there will be a big announcement at the end of this, uh, a big victorious announcement for the city of Armadale at the end of this uh, webinar. So Rebecca, I'll hand over to you. Okay, thanks. And hello everybody. Um, so I'll just get stuck straight in. Um, about the city of Armadale, we are a very fast growing suburb. Um, we're about 28 kilometers from Perth CBD. Um, we have about 91,000 living here at the moment, and by 2036, we'll have 141,000. We do have a higher than metro average percentage of children and young people aged 0 to 17, and um, around 16% of our population is aged 12 to 25. We also have a higher than metro average um, for our Aboriginal community as well, with almost half of our Aboriginal community aged 0 to 17 as well. Now we've got 19 suburbs. Um, they're quite diverse, both demographically and socioeconomically. And it is really pertinent to mention that because drilling down to suburb level data um, is really important to how we respond to issues, including issues concerning young people. 
So off the back of what you presented just then, um, I've got some, I guess, um, similar stats um, on one particular suburb. It's one of our most vulnerable, being Armadale South. So it's got an, a CFA of 840. And when you consider that um, the cities is 994 and the metro average is 1,026, that's a really low score. Unsurprisingly, youth unemployment is 27.6% and youth disengagement in general is 27.7%. Again, not surprisingly, the Australian Early Development Census shows that um, kids, kids aged 0 to 5 are um, substantially more developmentally vulnerable than kids across the city. Um, with over 20% of children developmentally vulnerable across two or more domains of the Australian Early Development Census. Again, um, no surprises, um, the educational attainment is low. So there's a significantly lower percentage of people that have achieved year 12. Um, and that's not, we're not even talking about degrees or anything else, just year 12. Um, also Department for Child Protection, their stats are particularly bad in Armadale South. Um, high number of reports and incidents and crime stats across the board, according to WA Police are also high. So as we know though, stats are one thing, they can tell what's happening in a suburb, but it's the lived experience of the people that actually live in those suburbs that can tell us, add to what is happening, but also why it's happening as well. Looking in terms of solutions, looking at um, what has worked really well in other communities that have similar characteristics is really important. And of course, making sure that the right stakeholders are around the table in order to inform a response. So basically these sort of elements of really drilling down to suburb level data, seeing what um, people in those communities are experiencing, looking at what good practice examples there are out there, and then determining the role of stakeholders, including the city, has really underpinned a new approach that the city has undertaken, and that is the social priorities approach. So it's around really looking at focusing our resources and addressing the most important social priorities at a suburb level, for long-term change, not just small programmatic things that might you know, churn people in and out, but we really want to change that data. So a bit more about the social priorities approach. We started this approach um, for the first time early last year, where we engaged 930 residents and 59 service providers um, and analysed their feedback to a whole range of questions alongside a whole heap of data sets, including the ABS, the ADC, DCP stats, crime stats, Department of Education stats where possible and child health. Um, then we looked at that to identify four social priorities that we could actually implement across five suburbs. Now I said we have 19 suburbs, five suburbs. The reason for that is we have a very small community development team. So within the community development department itself, we have three teams, we have major events and arts, we have Aboriginal development and we have community development. Um, in terms of the legwork of the social priorities, it's the CD team that actually does that. There are five officers in that team, that's it. So we had to restructure really to go from portfolio areas, which included things like youth officers, seniors officers, etc., to actually working um, in a project team on each of the social priorities in a different role. So just to give you um, a view of those social priorities that were selected. So for Armadale South, and I'll touch on this more later, youth engagement and education. For Brookdale, which is another vulnerable suburb, early years and family support, given the explosion of zero to four year olds there. Camillo and Seville Grove, community safety, um, police stats were um, particularly horrifying for those suburbs. And Harrisdale, which is one of our newer suburbs, culturally and linguistically diverse community connection to groups and services. So, all um, well, this is part of the background of, of how we're addressing things, but. Basically, the categories of um, how we respond falls into the categories of contracting external services, capacity building in um, smaller groups and community champions with community grants and volunteering opportunities, um, network coordination, we've got a number of sector networks that the city leads, and also advocacy as well. That's really important for more resources from state and federal governments. The point is, is that we want to work out what actually is effective in changing the data in a positive way. Um, it's not just about honing it on suburbs and that's it set in stone. It's about replicating effective strategies across the city, albeit with a tweak to the characteristics of the other suburbs. And so therefore this process happens every two years. We go back out to the community 
and analyze the data, some of the priorities might stay in place for some time, which is fine as long as we review them. So in the context of the discussion today about young people, um, we came up with a social priority of youth engagement and education in Armidale South, as I listed before, high need there for young people themselves, but there's also high levels of vulnerability across the community as a whole. So we have to stop the cycle somewhere. And if that means starting with young people to get them engaged and educated before they have families and before they keep perpetuating that cycle of disadvantage when they have their own children, that's the point of actually looking at that. There's no silver bullet, but you know, sometimes you've just got to do some action research and off you go. Um, with, that, um, with that particular social priority, this was definitely reflected by responses by both community members and service providers who noted um, disengagement, mental health issues and poverty as the most pressing actually facing our young people today. So responses from the city, broad brushstrokes, um, overarching principles, harnessing the energy of local people. So this means um, young people, other community champions, taking a holistic view, it takes a village to raise a child. Young people need those really solid, strong supports around them, including the right people in the right services. I'm a big one for the right people that are employed. Um, one person that doesn't actually quite know what their job is can, act, can cause a lot of damage. So we need those right people, not just approached by qualifications as well. And also the other thing is start from the beginning. Young people just aren't going to waltz into a course or a job interview without having their basic needs met first. So think Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If they don't have food, if there's lots of past trauma, if they don't have shelter, that all needs to be addressed before they can possibly be in the headspace to look at anything else. So that's really important as well. So they're the two things we've sort of looked at in terms of um, the approach for young people. So in Armadale South, um, the, I guess the discrete responses are, um, we've just applied for funding for a youth hub. That doesn't sound like anything new, but in Armadale it is because we don't have a youth centre. So basically it's taken some time to get to this point and basically it's um, a co-located model um, where there'll be a range of services that will sort of come by on a rotational basis, exposing them to services and supports, while also offering a whole range of activities, including sport. And that will be at a facility in Armidale South. So it's very local to those young people. The other thing is contracting to external organisations to provide additional counselling and other safety behaviour change programs in schools. So really capitalising on the fact that school, the school site is seen as a safe and, and accessible place for young people and families. Let's make sure that we're using that to the best of our ability. Um, we had a youth advisory council years ago. We're starting one up again with a hopefully really representative um, membership of young people as well. And then we've got some programmatic initiatives that have, that have come back through feedback, which includes skate competitions. And also one of our officers has um, developing um, a series of TEDx talks as well by young people for young people. Across the board, um, there's, um, a whole range of um, other things strategically that we're working on. Um, our team has been working closely with uh, my colleague Luis and his economic development team to deliver Armadale Aspire, which is a career focused program, um, basically joining young people, local high schools and local businesses to give them a taste of what industries they might choose to go into. We also operate the Champion Centre, which is a con our staffed community centre. It's a one-stop shop co-located model, actually aimed at building capacity in our, our Aboriginal community. Um, the whole premise of that is to have, well, so we can accommodate up to 24 organisations to hot desk at that centre, and that provides a whole um, range of services from Aboriginal health counselling. We run food security and emergency relief, child health as well. Um, and we also work with the Department of Justice to offer um, work order placements for young people um, involved with the justice system. We lead the Armadale Youth Network, which is a sector network of around 400 members. About 40 members attend a meeting every second month. And the whole point of that is share information, but also collaborate where you can. From a strategic viewpoint, um, I'm a member and represent the city on the full service schools management committee, which is, um, you might have heard of that, which is basically um, a whole raft of services um, offered that from a school site for young people from 11 
different schools, um, and also the Armadale District Leadership Group. And both groups comprise um, um, regional heads of state government department and local governments to actually get that collective knowledge in the room. We've also had really great news yesterday, um, which I'm going to leave to Louise because it's, it's the fruits of um, Louise's labour, this particular thing, and it's really, really exciting and will perfectly um, be a big ticket item in actually really trying to achieve the things we want to with our community. So I guess in summing up, um, the city's approach, we want to operationally and strategically work with the stakeholders that can affect the most change. We want to use data and community feedback um, and really optimise that so that we know what we're doing and we can be effective because um, the whole point is making long-term positive change in the community. Thank you. Oh, for cool. Thanks, Rebecca. Thanks, Rebecca. Gee, you've got some really significant challenges there. Yes. And, you know, I think what's really great is that example of how local government has responded by restructuring looking at things from a different perspective. So, you know, getting rid of those traditional silos, I suppose, that happen within councils and working across issues and, and making it more place-based. So, thank you very much. Thank um, you. We'll probably have some questions um, to, uh, towards the end, but um, I'll hand over to Dr. Lizzie Knight now. Um, I'll just, um, so, yep. If, if you wanted to, uh, we've run a little bit over time, so if, there, if oh, there's sorry. a way that you could um, bring us back, that would be great. But um, we're really pleased to have you here. Um, and yeah, I'll hand over to you. Brilliant, and thanks everyone, and thank you for having me. And I'm very conscious that I'm between you and some very exciting news. So I'll <laughs> keep, keep myself to town. And I feel I'm really pleased to be here and to see and practice what amazing work that, that you're doing both in the Alliance and also with the City of Armadale. And so I'm going to zoom out a bit. Um, and so I've just got a few slides of um, zooming out to the um, national and international uh, context. And I'm going to zoom through them a little bit. Um, I think. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about, um, so I'm Lizzie Knight, I'm a research fellow at the Centre for International Research and Education Systems, and that's sort of because we look at the systematic view, we're not so much in the classroom, um, although we do do some of that work, and we're interested in um, drawing on international experiences to inform our, our work in Australia and how that can help us um, in our work as practitioners. Um, so uh, that's is, so the Centre for International Research System, we do strategic research and we're closely associated with the Mitchell Institute, which you may know. Um, and I wanted to just um, flick through a little bit one um, a Mitchell Institute project, which is from the City Brimbank, the Brimbank in Victoria, which is not a growth area, but it's an interesting area. Um, that's a, a, some place-based research we've been doing there. I'm going to go over it very um, quickly. So this is a site that maybe some of you of your members would, would like to look at and I can send Bronwyn the link to have a look at. So what we did, we've, it's a longer ongoing project, we're taking with a health and education focus. So we've taken some um, health indicators, looking at spatial data to do things like, and um, Bronwyn was talking about looking at the city of Brinbank and looking at really in, in quite a lot of detail at suburb, the participation rates and thinking about a spatial analysis if there are spatial reasons that some of those, um, you know, differentials, and when we looked at the national rate it was 22% for bachelor degrees, whether there might be differentials for space-based reasons in that green bank area. I won't touch on that too much, and I'm going to go up again um, to, to have a look at some national um, research, which always talks about the major differences in achievements and post-school pathways between urban and regional. But we don't talk, I think, enough about what in the research is peri-urban um, <clears throat> materials and, and some of the challenges can be as significant and perhaps more significant because they're not seen as, as significant, if you see what I mean, um, for that peri-urban um, area. Um, some work that did take peri-urban uh, particular focus on peri-urban areas was this report from actually my doctoral supervisor and old boss, um, Professor Sue Webb through the NCBR and we're still involved um, in writing up some academic output. And there are some four really key, and I think um, learnings from that. 
that about um, that young people are significantly influenced by their um, educational career inheritance. Um, I've bolded the key things. Exposure to new ideas, so that um, Aspire um, Armadale sounds great. Um, a tolerable travel to study distance is a key factor once they finish school, and that physical and practical kind of issues are so are so important. And I'll send you the link to that report as well. And hopefully, when they get published, the journal article I can send along to Bromley. Um, oh, so some other literature I wanted to talk about is thinking about that risky tr transition we talked about for regional and remote areas. But also, it's risky if you're if your idea was either commuting or moving, it can be a very risky transition to move to tertiary education, particularly if you haven't got that social and cultural capital and experience of post-school and, no, and can, can't see the benefits of post-school education. The cost of travel and accommodation creates barriers um, compared to their urban peers. And this is the literature that I think with peri-urban sometimes should be more, um, uh, more present in um, instead of just regional and rural. Um, and I think there's also that first one by um, uh, Bill and Trevor Gale, thinking about the cultural barrier to participation is a really important one that has to be done systematically. And like Rebecca was saying, you have to look at it as a whole community approach. I love this um, quote, and I thought that this is sort of one of my last things, thinking about each young person is located in their social spatial context. It needs to be explored holistically to gain a broader understanding of their educational choices. And that's Marion Bowles in an um, article called They Talk About Places Like Me, which is really a useful um, thing. So in summing up very quickly, I think um, it's really important to see um, seeing between the urban and regional binary, you all know that. Um, I've got some stuff which I've cut out just for um, expediency about cold spots and some work that's been done in the UK about the polar and tundra measures. And that's why I chose this picture to end on which is actually a, it's a hotel, but it's a moving hotel in the tundra. Um, and I think there's some interesting things about cold spots. You have to go to the cold spots as opposed to expecting people to come to you. And that's where I'm going to finish. And I'm sorry, I talk very quickly. That's great. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, we will be um, circulating a heap of resources to come out of this. Um, this webinar, so we'll certainly um, share all of that information. But um, I just love the fact that also for, you know, for your background is sort of in careers counselling as well. So, it, you know, I love that aspect of seeing, of, of what we're seeing is from Rebecca's presentation through to what you're saying about the risky transitions and, and the barriers. Um, and, and now we'll move on to Lewis, who um, will talk about um, a couple of the things they're doing, including one way of trying to knock down that barrier, which is to move, to address the cold spot, I suppose, um, in vocational and education and education as well. Okay, I'll hand over to you, Louise. Right, thank you, Rowan. I'll, I'll do my best. Um, how much time do I have got? Um, all right, so I think um, from an economic development point of view, um, the, way, the way we're looking at unemployment, particularly with the youth unemployment, it's uh, <clears throat> to me it's people that don't have jobs and, and don't have access to, to jobs. And I think we've been hearing a lot about it lately as a result of COVID-19. Um, and in our locality in Armadale, there's obviously a, a, a problem there, otherwise we wouldn't be here talking about it. Uh, going into the area, yes, a rapid growing area, that is fantastic. We have available land, it's affordable. So that, that's, that encourages a lot of our young families to move in. However, um, you know, these kids um, go to school. Um, yes, we have a lot of primary, secondary schools. But um, now it comes down to what happens after they finish year 12. Um, and as a locality, we just don't have that, that capacity in terms of infrastructure to give um, our residents a path to move forward. So we, we experience a lot of leak, leakage from um, you know, young people either um, moving out to another tertiary education facility or simply they just put off by 
you know, not having access to that facility. So um, that's been one of the things that we've been looking at in terms of a strategic metropolitan center. What is it that, um, uh, what facilities have we got? What infrastructure we've got? Um, and when we looked at all the um, strategic centers in Western Australia, it's, it's clearly that some of them, you know, have the advantage of having a unit and they have a, you know, new tapes um, in the hospitals. Um, some, some of the strategic areas have um, residential apartments. Armadale doesn't have any residential apartments. Can you believe that? Then we looked at the ownership of land, also of, of um, things that make up a, a strategic center. So for the case of Armadale, um, uh, not having a university and also not having, well, we don't have a TAFE, but it's very small, very, very small TAFE. They just lease one of our buildings nearby and um, they concentrate mainly on um, ESL courses like English as a second language. So it's not really a, a game changer. Um, but something that, um, that's something that's been identified. It was identified nearly 12 years ago uh, when a lot of work was done in terms of advocacy here in Armadale. And one of the needs that was um, identified was the need of having a, um, a considerable size TAFE campus um, in, in the city center, which will help us you know, bring more people into the city center and also bridge the gap between kids growing up and, and, and wanting to, to learn new skills to actually get employed. Um, so that big announcement that everyone's been talking up a lot, now that I think about it, it is a big announcement. Um, it is unfortunate that we have to go through a global pandemic crisis to get a state government to actually look back and say, hey, there's a big opportunity here to do something great. Let's just make it happen. Um, yesterday, uh, Mark McGowan announced um, the biggest safe investment in the history of WA as part of the Fund for 5 billion uh, recovery plan. So they've allocated over $200 million to revamp all TAFEs, um, subsidize uh, TAFE courses. But as part of that package, they announced after 12 years, the city of Armadale has been advocating for this. We're gonna get a brand new state-of-the-art 22 million um, new TAFE campus in the city center. That is something that, again, it's, 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 it's part of the game-changing plans that we have. Uh, that coincides with a new police and courthouse prison that is currently under construction. That is an $86 million that is happening right now, opening, well, hopefully in 2022. Um, but then this, this, is, this announcement is one of those, like it, it was announced yesterday and that's when I started getting all the phone calls. Um, um, to be honest with you, I'm on annual leave. I've been taking a bit of a break this week. So I wasn't expecting anything big to happen until I got a phone call from my CEO yesterday going, Louis, have you had the announcement? I'm like, no, what happened? Like, we got the tape. So then it was just this, this snowball of just great news and relief that uh, after all of these years of pushing, um, we, we finally got what we asked for. It's not going to happen overnight. Obviously, it's going to take two to three years before we can even start construction. But we have the sites. We identified the sites. We have the plans. And I think the key for that is that we had all the information available. We had a strong business case. Uh, we've been working with the Department of Training and Workforce Development, which basically those were the guys that, that, that identified with TAFECO. So we've been working very closely with them. And when I spoke to... Um, Helen Smart, the director there, and she's been pushing for this. She was just, it took a long time, but you know what? You can't rush these things, but we, we did it. So it's, it's really good news. And in a way that's just gonna increase the capacity and the opportunities for young people to actually train and be better prepared to take on, you know, the, the jobs of the future. That's what we are talking about. But um, apart from that new big announcement, um, from an economic development point of view, um, Rebecca touched on this, and it's, it's the relationship between community services and economic development that is making a big difference now. I think that the time that you look at the economic development guys and just go, oh yeah, they deal with businesses and that's all they do, and community service, oh yeah, they deal with the community and that's all they do. Well, I think now we've learned um, that that, that um, what do you call it, that, that combination of areas is so important right now. Um, and, and to be honest, it's a bit daunting. Um, we still don't know what's gonna happen in the next 12 months and the next two years as a result of this crisis. And, and to be honest, that, that keeps me awake at night every now and then when I think about the local economy and, and what's happening. But I think there's, there's, we're turning at this advantage of, um, position that we were in Armadale to an opportunity um, that we had all our business cases ready to go. And now that state government and federal government are putting um, 
money to support some of those projects, we are, you know, very well, very well, very well prepared and in a very good position to get those uh, shovel ready projects off the ground. So that's very encouraging. So we took a disadvantaged position of being a council that hasn't had the, the facilities or the infrastructure to provide those services or support. And now that the pandemic crisis hit us, part of the recovery plan is to actually build on those facilities, which I think is it's, it's fantastic. Um, I don't know how, how we're doing with time, Rowan, if I have time to talk about Aspire. What do you think? I, I wonder if we might, um, like, Open could you do it in, in a one minute? Could you do Aspire yeah. overview in one minute? Yeah, so Aspire is one of those projects that's been done um, between community services and economic development. And it's basically, we go out to all the, all the high schools, we put it out there and we ask students to join the program. Uh, and on the other hand, we have a bunch of businesses, 10 of them normally, uh, that they offer to bring those students into the, into the premises. And it's a six week program where young students get a glimpse of what it is to be employed. They go into the workshops, they go into the car mechanics, they go into the warehouses, they talk to the business owners. And they obviously, they, they, they get some training on, you know, how to prepare a CV. And at the end of the program, they actually have to, you know, present on, on the learning. So it's, it's kind of a, a, a very good program that all elected members are really proud of. This year, we had to postpone it for obvious reasons, but we're looking forward to, to do it again. Great. Thank you. And um, congratulations to City of Armidale. That is, advocacy is a long game and 12 years is a long time, but hopefully this will be one of those transformational projects that, that really has that um, potential to make living in Armidale an advantage for a young person. Absolutely. So we might open up to Q&A and what I'll do is to kick things off is, is I'll just ask one question. I might start with, with Lizzie. Um, from a policy perspective and drawing on your international knowledge, what's one change that could be made, say, in, in our policies um, or in, in state and federal government policies that could really turn around that, that risk and that disadvantage, in your opinion? Um, and thanks for the question and for... Um, I think it's um, hard to um, uh, get past career information and career development from my personal position and starting early and starting broad, I think is such a critical part of engaging with that. So that's my one thing and things like the Aspire program sounds brilliant. Have you, um, you know, are there, is there work that you've been doing that's shown the success of that or, you know, is it a long-term thing or can it, can it make a quick change? I think, I think you know, there's, there's evidence that single interventions of at the right time, of the right sort, can make a substantial intervention. It just takes one conversation. You know, as a, I'm a professional careers counsellor and I'd love everyone to have ongoing, repeated, hour-long, with, but it's not economically viable. And I think that you just have to um, uh, make sure the information's there. I think the work that Rebecca was talking about, about the industry experiences, about local industry, making it visible, putting it in people's line of sight is a, such a critical, sort of making it seem realistic and doable um, and getting over those sometimes real physical and um, emotional barriers. Yeah, yeah, great, thank you. Um, I've got a question here for Rebecca. Yes. And um, it's around evaluation. So, yep. you know, all, all of the programs that you've been doing, what's your evaluation process for that? So with the individual initiatives, obviously there's evaluation um, built into those. So we, with any of our program planning or project planning, there has to be a section on how do we know that it's worked? What are our KPIs? What is the indicator? So uh, to be honest, as a sector, I don't think community services are incredibly brilliant at, um, at evaluating um, how we know that people are happy or how we know that we've changed lives. So there are different there we try to go to the to basically asking people asking people what's changed it's not the outputs bums on seats it's what's changed and measuring those is difficult in terms of long-term change um, with the approach it is around making sure that we're really au fait with um, if we can and that's part of the reason for doing it at the suburb level we have a much higher chance of actually correlating things like um, you know initiatives in schools to say school attendance and school achievement 
or if we're looking at community safety, for instance, what, and, and we have intel with the police and DCP as well, what are the number of contacts a certain family might have with the police before and after intervention? So um, is that looking at the hard data, measuring if someone's going to change their whole life based on our intervention is more difficult because there's lots of variables with that. So it's always an ongoing saga to get that right. Yeah. Um, look, at the end of the day, you've got to start somewhere and you've got to start with your baseline and then see where it changes. Mm -hmm. It's a big task, isn't it? But um, again, you, you end up with those good case studies, the good examples. You do. That it and changes that cultural change, isn't it, yeah. really? Yeah, Yeah, exactly. And it's, as you said, it's case studies as well. If you've got, a few, if you've got some encouraging stats, as well as some individual um, significant change, what's happened with people's mm. lives, and that can be quite powerful. But yeah, it is a hard one. Mm -mm. Um, I'll just um, ask people if they have questions or if they'd like to, to give a very quick overview of what's happening in their council, um, we'd welcome that. Um, but in the meantime, I've got a question for, for Lewis, which is, you know, I think we've, we know the answer to you, what's one thing that could do, <laughs> what's one thing that could be done to make a change, but I wonder if we could um, delve a little bit more into the connection with jobs. So, you know, how, how I know Armadale Aspire is about giving those ideas of what careers and jobs are available, but how do you go about it as local government working with business? To, to find the right people and to make sure the community has the right skills to, to join the, the local workforce. Yeah, well, that, that's a really good one, Robin. Um, I think as a local government, again, um, we are limited at some you know, level in terms of the resources that we have available. However, we, we run some programs um, with um, small businesses. Uh, we, well, we, we're gonna start one once this whole pandemic thing finishes. Um, um, it's a collaboration with the state government um, um, in terms of bridging that gap between unemployed people and businesses because then we get the businesses going, we want to employ people but we can't find the right people and yes there might be a lot of people out there but they don't quite fit. So kind of in a way, we, we're going to select a number of um, the small local businesses and work with um, uh, uh, job um, providers, job training, job and training providers um, just to, to run a pilot program on, on, on how we can help these businesses find the right people. But that, that's a very small, you know, just a small initiative that will run through the economic development team. Um, but I think um, the, the real... Well, the real challenge here is to work with the state government and all of those uh, agencies that, that have access to unemployed people um, and, and connect them with businesses. So from our side of things, from the economic development side of things, we have access to the network of businesses. So having a very strong relationship with the Chamber of Commerce, all your business groups, and knowing who the major employers are, that makes it really easy when we want to run a program, you know, there's... Um, you know, a youth unemployment program, we know who to target, we have the relationship built, we can go to these major stakeholders, you know, like the Stocklands or the developers, um, and, and they, they'll open the doors. So building that relationship is important. So whenever we have an opportunity that involves small businesses, it, it is welcome. Um, but yeah, it's, and the other thing that, that I need to add is all, all these things that we're talking about is, is about our experience until COVID. And that's the things that we've learned until now. What I'm looking forward is to see how we're going to come out of this because policy is changing. Policy is changing every day. Budgets are changing. The way we approach work, the way we employ people is changing. So that is going to be the big one. Like the next five years of how we all try to work things out, it's, it's going to be unbelievable. I remember having a chat to one of my colleagues that is in the state government. She goes, Louis, we're all flying blind here, to be honest. Like it's, yeah. We're trying to plan. We're trying to assess risk. But uh, the reality is it's all happening so quickly that um, in, in a way we're trying to be really nimble and, and, and make mm -hmm. decisions quickly. But yeah, it, it's, it's quite daunting to be in this position right now. But mm -hmm. I guess it's, yeah, we'll remember these times in the future and we'll tell our grandkids about it. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe. Um, so another question here is around, um, is for another one for Rebecca around, um, and maybe for Lewis as well, but when you have that internal structural change and, and look at a problem from a different perspective, how do you um, engage staff and win them over to that model? Um, 
when we know, because yeah. you know, we're based in local government as well here at NGAA, mm -hmm. and we know that the silos are, are the dominant sort of feature of local government. Well, um, look, it's all about communication, really. So, um, basically, it was around individual one on ones with staff members. Obviously, um, the coordinator was. Um, was we discussed that together and how we were going to talk with the staff about it. Um, my memory's really bad actually, but there was lot, there was one-on-ones and there was a workshop as well. We had lots of workshops around it. And I'm not gonna, you know, pretend there was some people that go, oh no, goodness, you know, I want to keep this or I want to keep that, which is absolutely natural and normal because it's the area of passion. But at the end of the day, it was very interesting, um, sort of the, the, the resistance um, we just kept up the conversation gave the really strong rationale because at the end of the day it's about the community we are employed with ratepayers money so therefore it's very important that we use our resources including our time to where it's most needed and only the data can really show us where it's most needed so everyone actually really got on board we've had um we've got the team we have now um is just absolutely loving it and, and one of the one of the officers that was was a bit worried um she's discovered she loves lots of the the whole different things and one of the um one of the staff told me that in the past when the phone rang and someone wanted to talk to the children or families officer she would always say well i don't do that so you'll have to, or, you know i'm not sure about that area so you'll have to ring back monday but she said you know what i felt like because of one of our social priorities being um you know in that area she said i could i could speak to it and she said i just felt like i was really genuinely helpful to that person at that time so it's around people being across everything and it's worked really well and how long did that take to sort of change i mean presumably this was a strategy that went up to council yes well yep. and what was their initial response and and how long did that process take to to make this well shift? part of this restructure it wasn't just restructuring the staff it was restructuring our funding program so we had a particular funding program called annual contributions and basically um organizations could apply and would give them the money however with grants, grants are fantastic, and we've still got one grants program and we've upped that, but we redistributed those funds. So community grants had more funds, so organisations could apply for a more hefty and robust amount of funds to do other stuff with, whereas the annual contributions were completely rechanneled into a service agreement um, GL, which meant that we had control on we, what we were contracting people to do. So it's like, guys, we've got this need in this, in, in this particular suburb, put your expressions of interest in and we'll assess it on that. And so basically we just turned it over. We, re, we um, did a council presentation in July, 2018, uh, no, hang on. We actually put a report up about the annual contributions in December, 2018. Um, that all went through people, they, like, they, they received that well. Then after we did our community consultation, so around July, 2019, another presentation, presentation was done to council, outlining the whole social priorities approach, all um, the, the churned up data, including alignment with what people were saying and our selection, our recommended selection of social priorities. They loved it, went through. And so um, it, it has taken a bit of time, um, but yeah, look, and it's early days, but there was just no doubt in my mind, this is the way we had to go. We cannot have one children and families officer the whole of the city responsible for thousands of people we needed to really narrow it down because we have limited resources yeah great thank you that's um probably a common situation <laughs> across our membership but you know it's fascinating to see that you've been able to do that with such a small team um but with a council that's really willing to make the change and to look at things mm. differently um Lizzie, I'll just ask you, with this window of opportunity that's opening um, and how we're responding post-COVID, um, from your sort of academic perspective and, and looking at um, policy developments, what do you think the opportunities are for government to really change the way it looks at either funding education and we look at the downturn in international students, you know, what's the prospects for universities and and, and vocational education institutions as well. Like everything's sort of at risk at the moment. So what, what, what's your thinking on, on what the future holds? I mean, I think, I think 
that these kind of events and sort of long events can change a lot and unsettle a lot of practices and make a lot of people think about um, what they're doing. I mean, I think it's um, interesting in terms of the next few years sort of predicted to have economic difficulties. And I think that we know that for young people um, that may hopefully mean that people think a bit think a bit more about um, different offers, about a job trainer, things like that, that are maybe um, attractive. Um, I think that there could be a real shift about in um, ideas about lifelong learning, about retraining, and about um, and I think that would be really diff different because I think we know the one first most effective thing is if your um, the parents of young people are engaged in even short courses with micro credentials and things like this, and they literally know then um, then the young people often sort of see it as a viable option. So I think that that discourse that seems to be coming in about shorter, sharper kind of skills-based stuff can really be transformatory um, to, to whole communities, is that you can say it's not that hard, we can do things bit by bit, we can build on stuff. It's not, a, this is, it's not an identity shift necessarily, you can still say, and I think that that's something I was thinking about a lot coming to talk to you all, is that there's also issues that you want the young people to, to do well, but you also want to, the economic development of the community and not this kind of, um, there's, a, there's a body of literature called dredge sites and cream students, people leave and then they're the problem, but what you want people to be able to meet their potential and achieve their dreams, you know, without being too career counsellor about it, um, but by staying in their community and helping their community and people want to do that by and large as well. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Look, um, I'll start a wrap up by giving a little sneak peek of what this all means for some research we're releasing next week on mm. the impact of working from home and or working near home. And, you know, I'd encourage everyone to register for that research launch in, in a week's time, because again, this is potentially a game changer. If if education can be delivered locally, um, you know, if, if young people aren't, you know, walking to the bus stop, catching a bus, then a train and, you know, you know, doing a two hour commute to get to study, then, you know, this could really change the way things operate. And, and you know, maybe the youth hub can deliver educational services as well, or maybe the new faith campus, you know, could host you know, other universities or, or TAFEs to deliver training. I, you know, we have to rethink how things are delivered and making, um, you know, embracing local, I think is going to need to be the way to go, um, which is really a major opportunity for growth areas because we are the commuters of, of Australia and um, we'll have some really interesting findings on, 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 the impact of working from home on how much sleep you get, for example. <laughs> you know, if you're not getting up to get on the 6.30 train, then, you know, that, that's a real bonus. So, um, I'd encourage everyone to register for that. I might also ask um, people who are listening in, just to put in the chat or the Q&A, um, we'd like to perhaps do more of these webinars. And I know one of the key issues that, um, is impacting young people is around mental health and access to mental health services. So um, if I could ask the attendees to just put into the chat or the Q&A, if, if mental health is of interest to your council, if there are other issues you'd like us to explore around youth and young people, um, and then I'd encourage you to sort of keep an eye out on our newsletters and our website for future webinars, um, because there's a lot of issues to cover and um, we're hoping to be able to do this um, as we're based in Melbourne. We'll be doing this from our home offices <laughs> for, for the foreseeable future. So um, I'd just like to, to wrap up then and say thank you to Rebecca and Lizzie and Louise. This is really interesting conversation. It's a bit of a, a kickstart really um, that, you know, this is part of our process of developing or reviewing our policy platform. The world has changed, you know, what we are advocating for will change as well. And, you know, the exponential impact on young people in growth areas has to be part 
of what we're trying to change in the future on behalf of our members. So, um, yeah, thank you very much. Please um, look out for our webinar next week on the working from home research. Um, congratulations to the City of Armidale for getting $23 million funding for a TAFE campus. <laughs> and um, thanks especially to Lizzie for, for making yourself available. And we're really um, looking forward to looking through that work that you've been doing and, you know, hopefully finding some opportunities in the future to collaborate as well. So thank you very much. And thanks to the NGAA team for all their help in, in, in getting this webinar up and running. So we will be um, sending out the links to recordings and resources um, in the next couple of days. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bronwyn. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bronwyn. See you all. Thanks. Thank you, guys.